Oh no, it's running. Oh, stop. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let me make the screen a little bit bigger so you can see my face. Uh. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Jay Wilson. I'm a freelance consultant through my company, Onyx Reporting. I've been trying to record this for what feels like hours, and it's killing me. But it's super important, so I'm sticking with it. Today we're going to talk about mean and median and why it's important to you. I can see your eyes glazing over. I see it. I see it. And you're like trying to reach to click to the next video, but don't do it. Stay with me. Um, the reason why you should stay with me is I'm going to tell you the most important question you should ask when you're thinking about accepting a job offer. Do I have your attention? Most important question you should ask. Here we go. All right. Now, when you're thinking about accepting a job offer, um, the recruiter or whoever you're talking to, they're gonna try and impress you by telling you what the average salary is. This is gonna be a fun game, guys. I uh, I went straight for controversy. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Average salary, bam, 69,000. You could be rolling in the dough. Now, average is interesting, but the question that you should ask, especially if you wanna impress somebody, you should ask what the median salary is. Why should you ask what the median salary is? The median salary tells you where the mid person is. If you have 20 people, it tells you what the middle person gets paid. Why do you care? Because the, knowing what the middle is gives you an idea of what you can expect for yourself. Now, I know you guys are all above average. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> right? You, you're, everybody's above average, right? But you want to know what the middle is. An average is not the middle. What do I mean by that? Well, let me sort my data in alphabetical order. Or sorry, yeah, in numerical order. And uh, we're going to number them. Um, and for illustration purposes, I'm just going to add one more person. 225001. Oh, oh, All right. Let's adjust our average calc. Oh my goodness. Did you see how much higher that number got? It, the average jumped from 69 to 77,000 by adding one person who was getting 225. And you're like, oh, don't worry. That's going to be me. Well, the median only moved. From 47 to 48. So again, the middle of the pack is only making 48,000. So what do I mean by middle of the pack? Here. My problem with median, sorry, my problem with average, and the reason why I really don't like it is because it's skewed by extreme values. If this number switches from absurdly high compared to everyone else to like marginally higher than everyone else. Note how the average moves. The average moved from 77 down to 68, but the median does not move. And what I want you to walk away with is this understanding that the median value is not impacted by extreme value. Like if you get if you stop the video now and understand that fundamentally understand that then you're in a great place. But let's not talk about salaries because salaries are controversial. Let me talk to you about a um, something that actually happened to me at a company that I work. So I was working in a consulting team, and they brought in an external data analyst, and the data analyst is like, "Yep, we're going to make you guys more efficient. Cool. How are you going to do that? Well, we're going to compensate you." Um, based off of reducing the average number of weeks it takes you to close a project. And Jay Wilson, ever the guy with opinion, um, immediately said, well, average days to close a project is a really stupid way of um, do, approaching this, and it de-incentivizes de what you want from us. That was very popular. <laughs> Jay, what do you mean? Well, because on average, most projects take between one to five weeks to close. Yeah, I get it. You want us to go from five weeks to close a project to four weeks to three weeks, close a project sooner, customers are happy, la, la, la. I get it. But here's the thing. We have like five or six big whales. Yeah? We have five or six big whale projects that have been ongoing for multiple weeks, even months, 
possibly years. And because we have multiple projects going weeks, years, months, it's skewing your perspective of what average looks like. It's taking the number of weeks it takes us to close from like five and pushes it out to like nine or 10 weeks. And that's not actually representative of reality. You need to accommodate for the extreme whale. And so by using average, one, you're not measuring the right thing. And two, arguably, you're de-incentivizing us from having big whales, which probably isn't what you want to do in a consulting company. I don't know. Who am I? The data analyst looks at me and she's like, um, in my entire consulting career, I've never used median because people don't understand it. It's too academic. Um, cool. Let's dive into <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, hopefully you understand the difference between average and median, right? Median just finds the midpoint in your data. Think about it in terms of widgets. Let's say you have two machines that are producing um, length of wood or pipe. I don't know. And you just report average. The average, I, I put in this specification. On average, it produces that specification. That's fine, I guess. But what if the variance is like plus or minus one centimeter for most of the things? Or what if the variance is plus or minus 10 centimeters across all the things? Which one's the better machine? For conversations like this, we need to understand. We need to understand what's in the middle. Let's go back to salvage. Median calculates the midpoint, right? So median calculates what's called the 50th percentile. If only I could type for in time. Um, the 25th percentile just says, as I look at my sorted data and get 25% of the way through the data, what is that number? In this array of values, where is my 25th percentile? 3.8. Here. And similarly, I can have the 75th percentile. So if you take your data and, and, and calculate the 25th and the 75th and the 50th percentile, they should be equidistant apart. Um, especially, uh, especially when you have them sorted properly. Sort. Okay, they should be space equally distant apart. And you're like, okay, Jay, this is like con conceptually very interesting, but why should I care? Well, okay, let's talk about disgruntle in the workplace. Let's say um, you have two employees and they're kind of in that between the 25th and the 50th percentile and they're discussing salary. The gap between the 25th and the 50th percentile is what, $10,000. So when they are discussing salary and comparing salaries, they're going to say, oh, my salary is only someplace, what, between two and $7,000 apart from my coworker. So there's, that's, that's, that's fine. That's reasonable, right? Two to $10,000 difference. Okay, that's fine. That gap between the 25th and the 50th percentile seems reasonable. As I look at the gap between the 50th and the 75th percentile, it's a lot larger. That gap is $20,000. So now, when I'm talking to my coworker, now I will be, let's say, between five and fifteen thousand dollars difference in salary. Now, if we have the same job, we're going to have to do a lot of justifying, justification to justify that gap, twenty thousand dollar gap in salary, versus here, this like 
$10,000, so not a big deal. As this number gets larger and larger, the problem gets more and more problematic. Does that make sense? So ideally, when we talk about what's called the IQR, or the interquartile range, that's what we're describing. We're talking about what is the gap between the 75th percentile, sorry, the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. How big is this gap? And how does that speak to, and where is the median uh, centered in that gap um, to talk about what kind of variance we're having? Again, if I'm talking about a machine that's cutting sticks, if all of the sticks are plus or minus one centimeter from the middle, that, that's one thing. But if they're plus or minus 10 centimeters from the middle, maybe that's a bad machine. If I only look at average, they could all have the same average, but that variance is not the same. All right, let's see what that looks like in Domo. I feel like I'm like talking a lot up in the air. Sorry about that. I hope, I hope this is all making sense. If I go into Analyzer, we have a couple tools I can help. I'm jumping straight for politics. I see you guys. Uh, we're going to put gender on the axis. Let's talk about salary. Looking good, looking progressive. The average salary between gender one and gender zero are the same, functionally the same. You might say, hey, we're doing all right. Of course, we're not doing all right. Otherwise, Jay wouldn't make a video about it. Um, I'll put salary on the axis again. This time I'm going to show the median salary. Now, one, if you don't have median turned on um, in, in, in Analyzer, this is a feature switch. So just talk to your CSM and they can enable the ability to see median. I'm going to label this median so that we can tell what we're looking at. I'm going to label this average and let this between gender one and gender zero, the average salary is the same, but the median is vastly different. One, the median is less than the average. What does that mean? Well, it means that you have some extreme values pushing the, the, the number up, which on its own isn't a bad thing. But it is interesting that the median, the 50th percentile, halfway through all of my employees, the median is $8,000 apart. So that means more employees in gender zero are making more money than employees in gender one because the median is $8,000. That's unfortunate. But how bad is it? Um, for a second though, let's, let's take a look at what it means when the average is so far apart. Let's look at this comparison here. So in order for the median to be 47, while the average is 69, that means we have to have an extreme value, like stupid high, like 200,000. Somebody's making a 200,000. The CEO is gender one. In order for the median to be 55 and the average to be 69, yes, there are some extreme values pushing the average up, but not the CEO. You've got some other C-suite people making stupid money, but not the kind of stupid money that is driving the, the average to 69, where the median is 47. That's kind of the stuff that you want to be able to see or understand when you look at data like this. But I'm a visual person, so let's take a look at the vertical box plot. Again, I see your brains just shutting down. You're like, box plot, that, I'm out. It's not so bad. Stay with me. Here's gender one. Median is that, that stick right there. And this says, this is the 50% mark. 50% of my employees are making, sorry, halfway through my list of all of my employees, 47 is the midpoint, yeah? And again, between Q1, the 25th percentile, and the median, that gap is 38 to 47, which is nine, eight, six, nine, nine, $9,000. So again, not a big gap. People are pretty happy when they're talking to each other about their salary. As we look at the gap, let's go on this side. 
as I look at gender zero, when I look at the gap between the median and Q3, that's a 95 minus 55 is 40. That's a $40,000 difference in the between 50th percentile and the 75th percentile. So they're talking like 20, $30 gaps or differences in salary. That's a huge variance. And you might have disgruntled there. That's why people don't want you to talk about salary. But that's why talking about average salary isn't interesting. What you want to talk about is mean, uh, sorry, median salary, the 25th and the 75th percentile, that, that range of difference. So let's talk about the whiskers of our box. Now the whiskers identify, um, in this case, the, the max and min value, but typically they'll also help you identify where the outliers are. So other box plots might have the little dots that say where the outliers are. Okay. Remember I said the CEO is gender one because it has to be so extreme in order to pull the median 47 up to an average of 69. Let's go back to our data first. Um, you might say, Jay, this is all very good. This is very all academic. What I want to do is I want to build a reporting mechanism that allows me to identify outliers so I can deal with them. Okay, salaries are their own thing, but let's set salaries aside for a second. What if we're talking about um, sensor data? Right? I want to do some sort of an IoT data analytics analysis, and I have sensors. What happens when a sensor records an extreme value? Well, one, how do I define extreme? And why would a sensor record an extreme value? Well, what if it broke? What if a thermometer just randomly recorded 100,000 degrees centigrade? Like, that's an impossible value. So I need to identify impossible value to either investigate or ignore as I'm doing analysis. A common way of doing that is to take the 75th percentile and then adding 1.5 times the IQR. Remember that IQR is an interquartile range. That's just the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. And on the other side of the coin, I might do the 25th percentile minus 1.5 times IQR. Guys, I see you inching for the mouse. I see you trying to like not pay attention, but this is this is a no, this is a non-data science-y way of identifying extreme values in your data, which will give you the ability to manage by exception. And we always throw that phrase around, manage by exception. What is in the exception? The exceptions are the extreme values. How do you define an extreme value? This is a method that's backed by state. Um, so I can take my 75th percentile. I can add 1.5 times the interquartile range, which is the 75th percentile, minus the 25th percentile. And so I get the number, uh, 120,000. So what is 120,000? It tells me that any value above 120,000 is weird. It bears investigation. These guys here are extreme values, and I should justify their existence. In the case of salaries, yeah, somebody's got to be the boss. I get it. But if, if I'm talking about measuring, like, cutting widgets or temperatures in an IoT use case, right, if I start having these extreme values, I should be worried about those. Maybe they're fine, but maybe it's a malfunction. In the context of my... Um, how the number of days it takes to close a project. One, one to five to seven to 10 weeks is fine, but 52 weeks or 104 weeks, right? Those are so extreme. We should probably ignore those because that's not normal behavior. Now, um, depending on your use case, you might choose to identify outliers as like 1.5 times the IQR and like so stupid it's probably broken as three times the IQR. Again, this is just stats, um, but you can apply your business domain um, expertise here to decide what you um, use as your kind of um, cutoff point for defining extreme value. Now, this is not available in the box and whiskers plot, and out-of-the-box Domo today, right now, doesn't give you the ability to do this 
unless you enroll and take advantage of some of the new beta features that are coming out. So if you're not familiar with the beta features that Domo has in the pipeline, talk to your CSM. It's a, Domo is doing such cool development and adding features to Delmo, arguably things that they probably should have put in place a long time ago, but I'm not gonna slag them off about that right now. Let's take a look at the Dive Views Explorer. What we're gonna see is how we can pre create um, basically alerts that identify extreme values for me in a data set. So what I'll start with is the Data Views Explorer. Um, they previewed this at Delmo Palooza 2020. Everybody's super excited about it, especially me. Um, I have the ability to calculate not only some average mean median, but I can calculate now the 25th and 75th percentile. Very exciting, very cool. I'll save that as a view. Now, one of the cool things about the data views is it's not an ETL, it's a view. It's a query being handled by adrenaline. So basically, as soon as the data updates in my web form, or new data comes in from the cloud or wherever, the views automatically update. I don't have to run an ETL. I see the results instantaneously. Very exciting. Um, so now I have two rows, one row per gender. I have my salary, uh, the 25th and 75th percentile, curiously captured as text. It's a beta. They'll fix it. Next, um, I'm going to create a blend. In this blend, I'm going to combine. on the gender, I'm going to remove the X of the column, okay. I'm clicking quickly, but uh, let's see what we have in our data. In our data, the end result is I have um, the transactional data, so one row per employee and their salary. I also have the 25th and 75th percentile for the gender, which I pulled together by fusing the transactional data with the data view. So functionally, I'm creating a view on a view. This is pretty cool stuff. Like Domo, yeah, man, this is this is pretty exciting. I would argue it should be out of the box or something I shouldn't be able to do in a beast mode, but we'll take what we can get. He's never happy that Mr. Wilson. All right. So what I want to do is I want to um, calculate the seven if you're the 75% outlier value. And that is the 75 percentile plus 1.5 times the IQR. What's the IQR? It's the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. So what is this telling me? What this tells me is that if the salary is greater than the 75th percentile outlier, I need a better name for that because it's not the actual name. Um, but if, if 41,000 is greater than 127,000, then it is, it is an extreme value. I want that in a report that comes to me and it has to justify its existence or exclude it from analysis. So just scanning through here, this salary, look at that, 225, remember our CEO? This is way outside of the boundary um, of 1.5 times the IQR plus the 75 percent tile. So why does it exist? Oh, it's because of the CEO. Okay, fine. But if this was like, again, widgets or temperatures, you know, we would want to investigate. So now what I can do is I can construct an is outlier flag. I love me a good outlier flag. So I'll say case when the salary is greater than or equal to that calculation, then outlier else. Now you would also do a when clause for the uh, below 25%, but I'm lazy, so I'm not going to do it. So now what I can do is I can put is outlier on the axis and I can also filter by outliers. So I can build a report that comes back to me and says, hey, for this transaction,
for um, this transaction, this employee, 18 and 19, um, this is their reported salary. This is how high it should be or what we consider reasonable, but it's outside the thing. So let's talk about it, right? Cool. You stuck with me this far. Thanks so much. Um, I hope you guys are getting some valuable um, information out of this. Uh, again, we put this, or I put this um, video together because I wanted to talk a little bit about mean and median. I wanted to talk about data literacy because, you know, one of the things that makes Domo super cool is you get access to all of this data at your fingertips. You talk about having insight and, and availability, see trends in your data. But I wanted to make sure that we're not interpreting the wrong thing from our data. And so we need to talk about how average different differs from median. And if I were going to sum it up in one statement, the thing that sets average and median apart is average is very subject to influence by outlier or extreme values. I talked about my example of most of our projects close in four weeks, but sometimes they close in two years. The extreme values will shift the average, making it so that the average is not representative of the rest of the population. Median, however, finds the midpoint in my data, the 50th percentile. And as long as I don't have a lot of extreme values, my median, my midpoint doesn't really move, or it will at most move up or down one or two slots. So as this changes, right, the, to, down to 25, the median moved here. But that's fine because it's still representative of the midpoint of my the midpoint of my data. We looked at the interquartile range, which again is the math, the, the difference between the 75th and the 25th percentile. The 75th to 25th percentile is important because it says the middle 50% of my data has this range. In terms of interpreting it, remember we had our little box plot. Now you have to decide what you want your, what's going on? Yeah. You have to decide what you want your box plot to look like, what normal looks like. But ideally, you want your median to be in the middle of your IQR, in the middle of this band. And you want it to be a relatively small band, or at least when it's a small band, a narrow band, it suggests it's, well, there's less variability in the data. Here, this is your HR person's nightmare your HR person's nightmare. You don't want people talking about their salaries because there's such extreme variance in the thing. Um, at the end of the day, we started off um, with average. And I, I am truly on a crusade against average. I hate it with a burning passion, mostly because people assume it means something. Um, I've gendered twice, and I need the whole problem was that when I look at average, average doesn't tell me anything, or it doesn't give you enough context to make good um, conclusions. When I look at average, it suggests that um, my employees are getting paid um, the same amount regardless of gender. But as I compare median, and average, we see there's a more nuanced story going on. There. There's more happening. And at the end of the day, regardless of what your use case is, that's what it's about. It's, it's about understanding that average and median are both very valuable metrics. Um, and interpreting them correctly is very important. If you have any other questions, um, or if you need help with your Domo implementation, my name is Jay Wilson. I'm a freelance consultant through my company, Honest Reporting. This is the kind of stuff that I think about all day. Um, if you want to reach out to me, uh, leave a comment in the channel or email me direct at jae at honestreporting.com. Thanks so much.